a few starting notes before we go deeper into the subject. And that is the purpose of these retreats or get-togethers. It's a very interesting word, retreat. Well, we may say it's a strategic retreat so that we can return upon life and world with a greater aspiration, truer understanding, a clearer vision, a more direct perception of truth. This understanding, this vision, this clarity does not come through talks, lectures, speakers. It comes from within us and it grows if we are sincerely seeking it. it it's the fire of aspiration which burns and burns away all that is dark and obscure, all that obstructs and limits, the fire of which we just read in Savitri, the secret knowledge. That indeed is the real purpose of these coming together. It's a collective yagna where we come together to intensify our efforts, to fortify our devotion, to make our faith stronger, more invincible. Otherwise, if it's just a question of few talks here and there, they are all available all over the world. <laughs> and this makes these meetings even more important. Because unlike individual yogas, Sri yoga is a collective yoga by its very nature. I don't mean to say that merely sitting together makes it a collective yoga, but we do join in our efforts and offer it together at the altar. And it helps. In fact, I feel that a day should come, would come, when we have many more such meetings. Maybe simply reading Savitri for two days, three days, people who are together in a nearby area, maybe in every city. Why not? Like a study circle. This is the way that this yagna grows. Otherwise, it becomes a ritual. It's not a ritual. It's not a custom that, you know, we have to come for a meeting. It's like every yearly. It's not an annual holiday program. <laughs> okay, a few days free of cell phones and free of, It's not that. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Particularly this new consciousness. The mother said it doesn't accept half measures. It doesn't let us stay in halfway homes of the spirit, which we have been used to linger for long. It's a thorough going process. And once activated, it doesn't stop unless we of our own stupidity throw away the, the great opportunity. Very often I hear People say, oh, we don't have time. I don't know what this time is meant for. <laughs> what do we do with that time? We are busy with several things. We have time for ourselves. We have time for money. We have time for fun. We have time for relations. We have time for everything. Except for the eternal. <laughs> we don't have time. But the real reason is, Perhaps we are lazy because it needs effort, ascension needs effort. To continue in the same habitual groove doesn't need effort. They are stock ideas, you know, things which we have been hearing, doing, they are easy to do, but this needs effort. Or perhaps we don't value it. We value everything except the eternal and that is the real tragedy of life. That is the real misery. Misery is not being born poor or, you know, even living without much in the pocket. That's not misery. Real misery is to be born upon earth because earth is a very privileged place. Sri Aurobindo uh, reveals that. All ancient mystic literature reveals that because sadhana is done in the body and yet be deprived of the divine. 
But there is a still greater misery and that misery is when grace comes knocking at our doors and we say no because we are too busy. And in that sense I do feel it's an exceptional Rama family where grace has come and uh, they've responded. It's, it's very rare. Grace comes. Comes to all. Nobody is... Uh, Nobody is left out. It's we who shut the doors. But what an exceptional privilege if we can respond to it. And who is the loser if we don't respond? We ourselves. So when the two meet, the grace and the human response, then there is the creation of a new world. New world is not created by human effort. No world has ever been created by human effort. We have only messed it up. We know it very well. Let's not, you know, (laughs) think we are too smart people. That's why in the Bible it is called as the fall. It's the fall. With the mental consciousness, we fell from the straight and direct response to truth. But of course, we have to regain rediscover this fall was deeded because we had to go through a long evolutionary process and as long as we value all that we are how can we ever become what we aspire to become and which we are not it's a basic contradiction we don't have to necessarily leave behind but we have to purify there is no other go There is a very interesting idea of the soul that is there in Vedanta, which Sri and the mother bring to the forefront with great force. This soul, how does it grow within us? It grows. This itself is a wonderful idea. It's not something static like, you know, hidden behind like a treasure. It grows. How does it grow? It grows through our everyday experiences of life. Through our works, through our relationships. Through what we do and what we do not do. Through what we choose to hear, not just hear. Through what we choose to speak. Through what we choose to see. Through all our countless choices of the minute and the moment, this soul grows within us. And when it grows, it begins to assert itself. Like the child who grows into adulthood. It says, now I want it my way. So when the soul grows to a point, it begins to assert itself. And the old consciousness, the parent resists. No. How can you have your way? I am the one who has brought you up. That's why it is called as the new consciousness. It's not new in the sense that it is something created magically. In fact, it is the oldest of the old. We read that marvelous line. Where sleeps the seed, the eternal seed of transient things. Where is the eternal seed? It is in the secret supermind. It takes many forms, many times. Creation has come into being and vanished. It's come again and vanished. And come again and vanished. We don't want to repeat this process. It's painful. It's waste of time and effort. We want to transform it. There is a big difference. So it is new to earth, new to mankind. We should not make the mistake of thinking supermind is yet another way of approaching spirituality. That most nebulous term where we have begun to dump anything and everything. Oh, I meditate every day. It's not about meditation. What I do when I am open, wide awake means a lot, sometimes much more than what I do when I am closing my eyes and having a beautiful experience. The divine doesn't care for our beautiful experiences. We can keep that to ourselves. It's our, it's a gift of grace. It increases our treasure, that's all. But this treasure is useless and of no good to this world if we do not use it for making this world a better place and making it a little more diviner, a little more beautiful. Otherwise, it's just a treasure. A lot of people come and say, oh, I have beautiful experiences doing this meditation and that technique. It's okay. So what? Somebody may say, I'm very rich. All right, you're rich for yourself. 
what have you done for this purpose of God under these stars? I become rich when I use it, use my wealth for creating something beautiful. That is richness. I help this world grow when I translate these inner experiences into everyday life. That is the real sign of a growing spiritual consciousness. So let's be done with pretensions. The new consciousness doesn't tolerate pretensions. It respects truth. It doesn't matter where we are, who we are. It doesn't care for all that. It cares for that little tiny thing in the heart, center, deep depth, where none can see what, again, we were just reading, hidden in the deep recess, whether it makes a response or not. That cannot be hidden to the eye of truth. Truth sees that, responds to that. We have used the word yoga for the earth. Let's get a few things, just the preliminary terms. I am sorry, it's my mistake. It should have been yoga of the earth. But it's okay. Chalega, yoga for the earth also. But more accurately, it should be yoga of the earth. This is a misconception we all believe, hold because, you know, we think as human beings, we are the ones who have to do everything. So we do the yoga. But Shubhindu sets that record straight away right. Divine does the yoga. All creation is an act of his yoga. Manifestation is his yoga. Evolution is his yoga. He draws that which is hidden inside. And he presses from within so that these things can emerge. It's happening between the divine and the earth. And we are caught in between. We are ourselves the product of a secret yoga going on upon earth. In Indian legion, there is a very interesting story or it's a series of stories with a common refrain. The refrain is that every time darkness increases on earth in the form of titans, which are nothing else but gigantic egos trampling the heart of earth, crushing love and light and peace and unity, earth goes to the divine and says, help me, rescue, intervene. And this aspiration of the earth gets embodied in those who are experiencing the oppression and aspire for a change. So darkness serves its purpose of increasing the aspiration. And there is an intervention from above and things change. It's a yoga of the earth. Earth aspires. We think it's unconscious matter. But it's not unconscious. It's only assumed a state of unconsciousness because thus alone could everything be lifted. This darkness be transformed. So it's taken upon itself. We have a very interesting understanding of earth. Earth, Bhudevi, is none else but the goddess Lakshmi. She has become earth. It's a great sacrifice. She has plunged into this oblivion and every time she is to be recovered. So, uh, in Indian thought, there are stories where every three months, Lakshmi disappears from the side of Vishnu. She plunges herself into the depths of the ocean. There has to be a great journey and she will be recovered. And she has become Bhudevi. Plenty, abundance. She holds within herself all the riches and all the treasures. But they have to emerge through a process of yoga. And as she plunges, the divine also plunges. This sacrifice calls for an intervention from above. There is another very interesting story about the old consciousness and the new consciousness and the process. And I am sure these stories are everywhere. At least I have read a few stories from the Bible which indicate that ancient mystics had an inkling of the new consciousness. For instance, the kingdom of heaven has to be first created within before it can be precipitated outside. We can't change the outside world if we have not changed ourselves. This is a fundamental thing. But I have a story from the Indian context because I am more conversant with it, familiar with it. And the story is perhaps well known. Shubindo speaks about it in one of his early writings. It's the story of Shati and Shiva. Sati is born to Prajapati. Prajapati is literally the ruler of the people. And what has he done? He has created frames, laws, measures. 
Everybody must conform to those frames, those rules, those laws. But as it happens, in his own house, a black sheep or a white sheep is born, who is none else but an incarnation of the Divine Mother, Sati. Sati is very strange. She, from her childhood, has a strange attraction for Shiva, the Eternal, but at the same time, she is in secret sympathy with her own father, the old consciousness, very much our state. While deep inside, yes, we are drawn towards the new. But what do we sympathize with? Is with the old. So she is divided and torn and she has to go through a lot of issues and problems and difficulties and anyways. Eventually, obviously, once we have turned to the divine, nothing can hold us back and she is wedded to Shiva. But it's not enough. It's not enough to simply say that, you know, I love the mother and I am open to it. It has to, the change has to take place. Because she is in secret sympathy, a time comes when she must choose between what the eternal commands or bids her to do or not to do and the old frames of reference and she falls back. And therefore she must die. But Sati doesn't die. She throws herself into fire and is reborn as Parvati. This is the fire of purification. That all that is sticks and clings to the old must undergo. There is no other way. It may burn us. It may hurt us. So much the better. <laughs> the sooner the better. But eventually it will be reborn. And this story I found very interesting because it speaks of the transition from one state to another. And who does the yoga for Sati? It's very interesting. Even as when she is Sati, it is Shiva who does the yoga for her. And when she is born as Parvati, again it is Shiva who does the yoga for her. He is the one who teaches and trains her and she thinks he is doing the yoga and eventually. So this great illusion it's not that we don't have to do something. We have to do our bit. But let's not live in a state of excessive self-importance. The divine does the yoga. It's because of his, his yoga that today we stand here as man, the mental being and aspire. But so long as we are happy with the old frames of Prajapati, he is nothing else but a mentalized consciousness which has built a lot of frames and it, in that frame, there is everything except the eternal. This is the interesting part about the mind. Nobody can deny that the mind has not done marvelous things. We have magic. Press a switch and things come. We don't even have to press a switch. Walk and the lights come up. Almost close to saying, and God said, let there be light, except that there is no God here. There is only light. And light without God is in obscurity. It's another name for darkness. We don't realize it because for a moment we are dazzled. But this dazzling is a kind of blindness. Just as we are dazzled with miracles. Oh, so and so Guruji does a lot of miracles. Let's be careful. Spirituality is not an instant cup of coffee. It's not ready to eat food the way we go and pay some money and we get KFC. <laughs> well, it's only KFC which can do that or the McDonald's or whatever else, a lot of brands come in, I have no clue. It's hard work, it's a long process, it's a sincere effort. And the effort is to let the divine work in us. That is a big, big part. We want to do something. Often people ask, tell me a method. Well, <laughs> what method divine has used to make evolve us from matter to man. When we look at it, it's very interesting. What did the divine do to the little creatures in the ocean? Or even before that, from the inanimate to animate life, what did he do? Suddenly the most helpless thing emerges, the algae and the moss, clinging to the stones, not knowing <laughs> what to do? <laughs> and this earth is covered green. Beauty is born. Colors are born. 
and what about life from ocean to land? He picks up the little mud fish, the most helpless creature. He doesn't pick up the whales and the sharks. Whales were of course not there, mammals, but other fishes and says, I am going to transform you into human beings or into creatures of the land. He doesn't do that. He knows whom to, she, uh, whom to pick up. That's why in the Bible it is said, it is the meek who shall inherit the earth. So he picks up a little mud fish and throws it out of the ocean. What happens? It struggles. It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to breathe. It is accustomed to the old way. If you ever see a mud fish, it's a miserable and pathetic condition. It is all the time restless. It tries to breathe in that little cesspool, this little water. But eventually, it outgrows its limitation and becomes a wild boar, a tiger, a lion. See, it will evolve. Within the mud fish, these possibilities were hidden. But what did the divine do to bring out these possibilities? Threw it out of its comfort zone. So if we learn our, if we love our comfort zones, and these comfort zones are not so much physical, it's not about being at this place or that place. They are comfort zones of thoughts. They are comfort zones of the old set of values, the old system of life. What is called in India is chalta hai, chal raha hai, chalne do. You know, it's going on, let it go, <laughs> don't change. It's a kind of laziness, complacence, and so it carries on. But when the time for evolution comes, he picks it up, that little mud fish, and throws it out. And it evolves. That's God's face. He doesn't teach the mud fish to meditate. He simply throws a challenge across to its life. A challenge where its own existence is threatened. It's a very interesting line or a passage in Savitri, Book 1, Canto 2. An absolute supernatural darkness falls sometimes on man when his soul draws near to God. An hour comes when fail all nature's means cast out from the protecting ignorance that he must cast off from him his surface soul and be the ungarbed entity within. It's not exact lines we can go and refer back but essentially it's the essence is that he sends darkness surrounds individuals and collective life of humanity. And it is so that we can aspire for a new dawn. Otherwise we are very happy with the way things are. That's not a good state. This kind of a contentment, satisfaction with the old order of things. When mother was asked to say something on renunciation, she said something very interesting. She said in, in old yoga, there is a lot of talk about renunciation. But we don't talk about renunciation at all. So why not? She says, because when you have to renounce something, it means you still value it. Oh, I am renouncing this. <laughs> renouncing what? And for what? Those who have had a touch of the divine know that Whatever they may have left behind is nothing compared to what one gets. It's nothing, nothing. It's dust. One thanks the divine that he snatched away, took away all that one felt as prized possessions of the world. It counts for nothing. So as long as we have to renounce means we value. And then she says something very interesting. She says, as long as we are not thoroughly disgusted with the world as it is. As long as we do not want it to change into something more beautiful, more divine, more harmonious, more true, we are not yet ready for this yoga. So if the old world satisfies us, fine. No issues. <laughs> we will know what it is. Unfortunately, sometimes it's too late. Spirituality is not an old age pension scheme where one goes to a church or a mosque or a temple every Sunday so that 
when the time comes, there is a seat booked in heaven. <laughs> that's spirituality is a process that's best if it starts young, when we have all the energy, all the strength given to us. But it doesn't matter. Whenever we start it, at least it's better to start it in the true way. So it's a yoga which is being carried by the divine and we have to open to that process, allow ourselves to go through this process. It's a most beautiful and delightful process. It's not something painful if we really value the divine. It's painful only if we do not value the divine. It's painful if we cling to all that we cherish in our ego openly or secretly. Then it's painful. But when we value the divine, what sacrifice, what renunciation can ever be painful on the path? I often give this example and it's so true. When you know, I am taking this physical example, but we can take it in any which way. When we go to Pondicherry. So, you know, the journey is not always, it need not be smooth. Many things may happen. We may have a diarrhea, for instance, fever. <laughs> Our purse may get stolen. Stuff like that. Do we say, oh my God, it was such a... When we reach there, all that has no meaning at all. So what? I remember two small stories. One which I had encountered and the other one. The mother says that when a man, he landed to India as he was shifting from the boat to the sea, to the land, suddenly his favorite pen, gold pen, dropped and he, he lost it. So, look at the attitude. Instead of saying, oh my God, you don't need thieves in India. The boats are not good and it's so horrible. Why can't they build a nice way, you know? I lost my pen. He said, but why? It's the effect of India. It has taken away from me my position. I can be a free man. <laughs> That's how it starts. I remember meeting someone, a young lady who was a you know medical graduate coming from elsewhere, and she was furious at the bus stand. Furious about her purse. She had purchased in India and it had you know broken off and this and that. She was cursing everything in the world. So I went and told her, look, did you come to India, young lady, to buy a purse? And for a moment she didn't know what to say. <laughs> I said, you could have bought it anywhere. India is not famous for making the best of purses. Of course, there are very good uh, now, you know, I didn't know that time about high design and other brands. But that's not what you come here for. You come here for something else which you can't get elsewhere. And when you value it, then what price is there which one would say that is, is, was too much? Nothing can be too much. This is the state, this is the inner attitude. And when with that attitude we engage in the process of yoga, then it brings results, fruition. It at its right season, that we have to remember. That's how earth, everything on earth is an evolutionary process. This is the second thing we need to remember. New consciousness cannot be grabbed like this and pulled down and today I start, I am an entrant on the path and after one day, one week, it's not a crash course. 30 days program after which we are siddhas on the way and one year yoga and two years nirvana. It doesn't work like that. Everything on earth evolves. It has its process. Look at the farmer tills the soil. Then he sows the seed in the right season. Then he waters it. Waits for the time. After putting all the effort still. He can't command. I have done all I had to do. Now tomorrow I want a mango. <laughs> if he tries to do that and digs the earth to look where is the mango. 
he will lose everything. So patience is so much necessary. Sometimes he waits for years. Sometimes it's not his generation, but somebody else may bear the fruit. Or to put it, use the metaphor, sometimes there is a lifetime of effort and then the life of fruition. It's fine. There is a season in which things will happen. That's one of the big problems I, I see in, you know, even as a counselor. People come and they say, oh, my wife, she's horrible. And always, you know, wives are horrible and the husbands are the most, you know, distasteful people. He smells awful and this and that. So they've hardly married for a year or two years and they have begun to, you know. So I have to explain this simple truth that there are no ready-made husbands and wives. <laughs> we can make our suits for the marriage they can we can get ready made <laughs> but there are no ready mates perfect husbands and perfect wives it takes long long process going through many ups and downs and all kinds of things to say when you are 80 that yeah <laughs> we can live without quarrel <laughs> so earth is a field of evolution Many forces work here. They clash. They operate. It should not frighten us. It should engage us even more deeply. That's why yoga is not a part-time process. It's a full-time engagement. Because all the time we are dealing with some energy, some force or the other in this world, in this creation. And it's up to us what we do with it. It's come to us. And it says... Please, may I get entrance? So we can say, yeah, 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 I, yeah, I like you very much. Or we can say, on one condition, that we will subject you to the divine and see how you fare. In old time ashram, not now, obviously for various reasons, things change, evolve, that's a different story. In old time ashram, for everything, People had to ask the mother. Somebody brings a basket of apples and Pavitra Das sends a word to mother. Mother, can I take these? So and so has brought them for me. Mother says, only once last time. What's wrong with having apples which somebody has brought? Because it's not apples. We know one apple, <laughs> what it did. <laughs> <laughs> another half an apple which has created a world of <laughs> products <laughs> apples are nasty things <laughs> no they are good for health but <laughs> but the point is that it's not just an apple it's a consciousness it's a interchange which is taking place all the time we are not conscious of it we think, oh he is very fond of me so he's given me an apple it's not just giving an apple. It's a whole world that we receive through that apple. She would want us to be conscious. Another story which I was sharing with how, you know, human measures don't hold good when we go to the divine. That's why we should be very, very careful. Yesterday I was sharing Duman Bhai's story, known earlier as Chuni Bhai. It's a very inspiring story how he came to ashram and he was married young at the age of eight. His wife was eight. I think he was 11. Those days, you know, early marriages. And then, of course, he had a seeking, went to various ashrams, eventually was spinning the charkha at Gandhiji's place, very close to Gandhiji and uh, Sardar Patel and all these people. But he was very restless. And Bhakti Ben comes all the way from Pondicherry and says, no, you are not meant for here. Go to Pondicherry. <laughs> So he goes to Pondicherry. He goes with his wife and says, I want yoga. Sri Aurobindo says, what do you know about yoga? <laughs> you want yoga? <laughs> Is it something like that to be served on a platter? And Sri Aurobindo spoke for an hour about yoga but did not allow him to stay. So he and Kashi and his wife had to go away. So this carried on for a few years. Eventually he left his wife and came. Now here the story takes a very interesting twist. Obviously everybody in his, in his, you know, for those left behind, their world collapsed. 
even gandhi ji and uh, patel felt it's a great loss you know he, they were counting on this young man probably he would have risen very high in the echelons of uh, that time politics but well he chose and he came away so his parents asked him don't you think you have a duty towards your parents what do you want to do about them he said why divine mother will take care of them and he says that how the mother took care of them till their last we should not take this lightly we think oh we have to this idea that i am responsible for everything if we truly surrender truly it should not be a guise to conceal my laziness and if you truly we are spending time in seeking the divine then his promise stands yokshema vahame ham it's not just an lic logo they have you usurped it the original is in the gita i take care of all your necessities all that you there are instances where mother took in many members of the family simply because there was a one person who turned towards yoga she took care in so many ways because it's not an easy thing we may not value it and the world may not value it but for the divine it's one heart sincerely turning towards the yoga then of course after number of years his wife came so she was there for about a week or so and he didn't meet her so his wife sent word that see when i go back people will ask me how is chuni bhai what do i tell them so he asked the mother what do i do mother said you meet her what is the problem he said no mother i will meet her only in your presence so sure enough a meeting was arranged in the sense that before going she has to come to the mother and as she enters dhuman bhai enters to the other door and they meet for one minute god knows what transpired <laughs> and she goes away and eventually of course she comes and she she had she grew up in her own way in in the in yoga through his seeking so essentially this new consciousness demands that we center everything towards the divine it doesn't matter we don't have to worry what will fall away and not fall away if something has to fall away it falls away it's part of the great uh, you know journey countless times this world has fallen away from us every time we have died why are we so afraid of you know losing things in this world so many times countless times the very ancient mystic molana room and he says why should i be afraid of dying when i died a mineral i became a vegetable when i died a vegetable i became a bird when i died a bird i became a man why should i be afraid of dying so to be reborn new born into the spirit is to be ready to die die at each moment to the ego die at each moment to the old die to all that clings resists holds us back and it can be done each moment it can be done each day at least we carry the burden of our past and we are full of all that guilt and suffering and pain and god knows and our whole personality stinks of that in fact this is the problem our personality this is the big problem i i am so and so so this is the whole process this is a yoga of the earth and we are conscious participants but we shouldn't give ourselves an excessive importance if we don't do it well the yoga will still be done maybe the dolphins will do it some day million years down the line but earth is destined to awaken to the divine glory which is concealed in it because the divine is within it that's what shubindra says the supramental is inevitably in the very logic of things so when we doubt that oh shubindra has said all this about new world and you know i don't see it well i don't see beyond the tip of my nose so my seeing anyways is not important but leaving that aside leaving also aside that evolution has taken place thus far 
leaving everything aside, if we really believe that there is the divine, then where is the doubt that evolution will not take place? If there is the divine, everything has emerged from the divine. Is he just going to leave it in a mess? Surely he is doing something which he can, which he should. We may not understand it. Does a child ever know what his mother is doing secretly in a kitchen and arranging his room when he is playing football out there in the play field, getting hurt, falling in the mud, getting up again, taking joy in the same game? It's only when he comes home. Then to the mother doesn't reveal everything she has done. She says, come to the bathroom first. Wash your feet. No, mama, I don't want this. I am hungry. No, no, no. You go first. And she gives a nice scrub and the child is crying. Cruel mama. All mamas know this. And the mama says, okay, you may call me whatever you want. I know myself that I love you. You'd, I don't need your certificate to tell me that you love me. I know that I love you. It makes no difference. We may cry and say, oh, divine is very bad, horrible. Okay, he'll still do what he has to do. <laughs> Give us a nice scrub. So when people complain, sometimes they complain. Oh, divine is bad. He is so horrible. He has done this to me, done that to me. The first thing is that when he did many good things, we never gave any credit to him. It's mine. Oh, I passed out. I did this. I did. You know, everybody has a whole list of I did my achievements. So when something happens which is not up to why blame the divine? Probably I am responsible for it. We can't swing between two worlds. What I try, I'm trying to say is that we can't use the divine as a convenience. It's not a like pastime thing that, okay, whenever I uh, am hurt, it's the divine. Poor fellow, he can't even say anything. He, we don't listen to his point of view. <laughs> most, most often he doesn't care to say this. He says, I'm st I'll still do because I know it's good for you. Give you a nice scrub. So we can complain. It doesn't help. We have these people, you know, who are eternal grumblers. Oh, life is bad. It's horrible. Look at India. Look at America. Look at this. Look at that. Look at my wife. Look at my child. Look at this. Except saying, look at myself. <laughs> I am good. Everybody is bad. So this is one approach we can take. Divine is the most horrible person on earth. It's okay. But what are we doing with that? It's not enough to simply say that things are not what they ought to be. Yes, they are not what they ought to be and everybody knows it. But can I do something about it? And herein comes the new consciousness. Divine is doing something about it. Let's have that faith. And let's participate in that process. Surely he wants us to lead a beautiful life. Harmonious and happy life. He doesn't want us to suffer. This is a wrong thought. The divine wants us to suffer so that we can remember him. That would be a most horrible divine. Give us suffering so we can remember and worship him. He doesn't want it. But it comes in the process. The game of football is meant for joy. We bring in victory and defeat. So then there is a foul play and red cards and green cards and falling in the mud. It's because we have brought in these, the mind has brought in these dualities. Otherwise the game was just for fun. Delight. But the mind brings in with its own set of and then it frames certain rules and then it gets more complicated. People find how to overpass the rules. You know how good players know how to give a fall without being noticed. Or good lawyers how know how to save a criminal through a slight of words. So mind creates problems, complications and again it tries to solve them with another set of rules. But the divine has to, you know, every time the mind tries to solve a problem, it puts a still more tight and rigid structure. Of course, it's divine still finds a way through all those little, little tiny holes seeps into our consciousness. But if instead of doing all this, we could simply open ourselves, surrender, give ourselves in sincerity and entirety. Or if nothing else, if only we could consent. That's all the divine wants. Yes. And let me close by reading something 
from the mother's writings. How she places the problem and the solution. Solution is not cursing, grumbling, complaining. Solution is not keep on multiplying, you know, all kinds of mental play booths. It's, it doesn't help. We have done it, but let's understand that that's not the issue. We have, may have the best system, the best party, and yet if man doesn't change, things won't change. They will come back to the same impasse. After all, the whole problem is to know whether humanity has reached the state of pure gold or whether it still needs to be tested in the crucible. So first let us work towards this mixture in us, there is gold within us. It's mixed with all kinds of things. You have to go through that process of purification. Then only it can be set to an ornament. First it must go through the crucible of purification. One thing is evident. Humanity has not become pure gold. That is visible and certain. Who can deny it? But something has happened in the world's history which allows us to hope that a selected few in humanity, a small number of beings, perhaps, are ready to be transformed into pure gold. So again, this yoga is not about numbers. Sri Aurobindo was asked this question, that there are so few who follow your path. Sri Aurobindo says again and again, it's not about numbers. It doesn't matter. One, ten, maybe maximum hundred, if that can change. I think we are almost 50. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a great, tremendous thing because the rest will be like a critical mass effect. If this much can change, the rest will be tipping point. It will create a difference to the earth, atmosphere. and So it's the first initial few. And that they will be able to manifest strength without violence. A wonderful thing often associate strength with bullying, but strength without violence, heroism without destruction, and courage without catastrophe. That is the challenge. Divine strength, divine power, but without losing our heads, without getting it into our ego. It's my power, my strength, and I can do this, and I can do that. But in the very next paragraph, Sri Aurobindo gives the answer. If man could once consent to be spiritualized, if only the individual could consent to be spiritualized, could consent, it will start with individuals. Let's not undervalue that. It's not about gathering crowds. Sri Aurobindo's yoga is not like that. It's not about thousands of people gathering and listening to a Babaji and, you know, all kinds of chadhava and offering and dakshina and bank balances in cash and kind. It's not, not that stuff at all. That's all old world. It's a serious business. A, and all true yoga is a serious business. There's a story about Guru Nanak. That one of his closest disciples, Banda Sahib, tells him that, you know, you have so many disciples. He says, oh, really? He said, of course, yes, see. He said, oh, you want to see? He said, what is there to see? I see it. He said, no, you don't see it. He said, okay. Tomorrow I am planning an excursion. I am going out. Spread the word who is coming with me. So, he spread the word. Everybody is very happy. Guruji is going. I must go with him. So, they all start the journey. Next, the whole, that community is already happy. We are going with Guru Nanak. They are all going with him. So happy. But then, he doesn't stop. He doesn't want a picnic. He is just carrying on. They are saying, please stop for a while. We want to have our cup of tea. Nothing doing. Straight forward. One pointed. Like a fire that goes straight to its target. He proceeds. Slowly people are getting tired and say, My God. That's enough. When he comes back, then we will meet him. <laughs> then he continues the ascent. And as he continues, others say, He's surely gone mad. No shaving, nothing. He's not even stopping for his normal things. We can't follow like this. 
and so on and so forth till only one disciple remains. And he said, now you know how many disciples I have. Let not numbers fool us. It's not mathematics. Divine mathematics is very, very different. Let's remember the great and wonderful word from Savitri. One man's perfection still can save the world. We carry within ourselves the world. Just one man, one person, one person who has to give himself completely. That's all the divine wants. It could be any person who has been touched by the fire. And that is enough. He doesn't want that how many persons we are gathering. It's not important. One man's perfection. Something in him asks for it, aspires, and all the rest refuses. We want a new world. Yes, of course, new consciousness, wonderful, super mind will come, things will be wonderful. But as we see in Savitri, his prayer rose and sank in the resisting night amid the thousand voices that deny. wants to continue to be what it is, the mixed one which needs to be cast into the furnace. So it will be cast again and again into the furnace of purification. At the moment, we are at a decisive turning point in the history of the earth once again. Several times these decisive moments have, to, have come and gone. Some are documented, the great descents when we had to make a choice. And then after a few hundred years, the choice is taken away. Once again the moment comes to make a decisive choice. So again a moment has come when we can make a decisive choice. From every side I am asked, what is going to happen? Everywhere there is anguish, expectation, fear. What is going to happen? There is only one reply. If only man could consent to be spiritualized. And perhaps it would be enough if some individuals became pure cold. That is the great reassurance. We shouldn't worry about what's happening to others. It's not our business. We should be concerned about what's happening to us, within us. It would be enough if some individuals became pure gold, for this would be enough to change the course of events. We are faced with this necessity in a very urgent way. If few could change, they would tip the balance in favor of light, of truth, of harmony, of love. This courage, this heroism which the divine wants of us, why not use it to fight against one's own difficulties? one's own imperfections, one's own obscurities. Why not heroically face the furnace of inner purification so that it does not become necessary to pass once more through one of those terrible, gigantic destructions which plunge an entire civilization into darkness. Mother wants to withhold it several times at least on a couple of occasions, Mahakali came. She wanted to destroy. This civilization is not worth it. At one time within the ashram context, when the ashram was attacked, then Mahakali came. She said, you want to create a new world with these fellows? <laughs> Which included those near her. I am going to wipe it clean. Mother held her. No, no, no. These fellows... <laughs> For eight hours he held her. Till then people would say within the ashram, Oh, we'll go and take on. No, no, wait. <laughs> because she knew. <laughs> right now, it is another power which has come out and that can destroy a whole. So she held everybody back. And after she had pacified, then she said, Okay, now you can go and handle the hooligans. <laughs> It's safer, less disastrous. So this is what has happened to civilizations. They have risen to a point and collapsed. For time it's nothing. We may think very high of ourselves, of our systems, of our computer. We know that how a whole computer system can get jammed. 
It's not difficult. <laughs> we have to live in an illusion to believe in our, you know, uh, invincibility. We are extremely vulnerable people. An ant can make us twist and turn. <laughs> we are as vulnerable as that. It's sometimes good to remember how fragile we are. And then also to remember how strong we can be. Both things together. This is the problem before us. It is for each one to solve it in his own way. This path is unique for each one. There are no fixed methods. There are no fixed practices. There are no fixed teachings. It's an action and we can participate in it. To each one, this new consciousness will unfold in his own way. It's not going to take the same route in, from A to Z. That's why it's not a sect, it's not a cult where everybody comes, does the, takes the same initiating mantra and does the same practices and you know, wears the same dress. It's not that. It's not a sect or a cult. It's something vast as the ocean which is one and yet so different. This evening I am answering the questions I have been asked and my reply is that of Sri If only, if man could once consent to be spiritualized. This is what she is repeatedly emphasizing. All that she needs is that we should say a yes, a sincere yes from within our hearts. Yes, mother, we want to change. Whatever it takes, the rest is your lookout. Sincere, yes. It's not, we are not now happy to continue with this kind of a state of affairs. We want something truer, more beautiful, more harmonious. And if there is a yes, then things change. And I add, time presses from the human point of view. From the divine point of view, all eternity is there. From the human point of view, we face an urgent, crucial choice. I would close it here. It's just time. And we'll take question and answers in the afternoon. So I have thought we'll do like this every day, whatever we have spoken of. In the afternoon, we'll have question and answers.